Hello everybody, welcome to the Film Fan Theories Iceberg Tier 4 Part 2. So today, yeah, we're going to just be finishing off Tier 4. Uh, this is the final part for Tier 4. So yeah, it's going to be good. Um, thank you again for all the support. I think I'm going to be setting up a Kofi. So if you want to check that out, I'd really appreciate it. Um, but I just really, it's not mandatory. Nothing's mandatory at all. And nothing like that is mandatory. But I appreciate the support. I might set up a Patreon at, at some point. But we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I just really appreciate the support. Especially in the last video. It was insane. It's at like almost a thousand now. It's absolutely insane. So thank you guys so much. And thank you all for the kind words. Just absolutely incredible. So just thank you very much. And uh, yeah, let's get right into it. The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park aren't dinosaurs. So because of the inaccuracies of, for example, velociraptors in Jurassic Park, people believe that they're not actually dinosaurs. They're sort of a genetic mutation uh, engineered, not specifically as dinosaurs would have been when they were around. So people essentially believe, you know, they're these like two species mixed together or multiple species mixed together. This would obviously make a lot of sense because I mean, how can you create a creature that is completely 100% accurate to a creature that's already gone extinct? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Obviously they're, they're doing things like this, like making a mammoth. Uh, bringing the mammoths back but you can't obviously one-to-one -one ratio it you can give a guess but there's no way it's going to be exactly like the dinosaurs that were roaming about the ones that you know the specific ones that went extinct but also you know there has to be some sort of genetic engineering there that's going to cause abnormalities in fact you know who says they're not robots who says they're not these gigantic, you know, animatronic-like things. We, we don't know, right? There's no certainty there. Uh, perhaps there's a scene where one of them is cut open and we can see how oh, it's not a robot, it's not an android, it's not a an AI, whatever. But everything can be faked is a thing. And because of the Velociraptor not looking like that actually in real life and being accurate, it could be something like that. It could be sort of botching together different parts of different mammals and animals uh, to create a, a dinosaur as opposed to you know what they describe in the film basically genetically reviving the species. The narrator and Tyler Durden are Calvin and Hobbes. So there are actually a lot of things that would suggest this to be 100% true. So basically Calvin and Hobbes was from what I think first a comic and then a cartoon and both of these character characters are representations of uh, basically those characters in those, oh, sorry, comic strip, um, the comic strip. And I actually think that, so Calvin, basically he had an imaginary friend who in the film is unnamed, which could be Hobbes. Obviously we know Tyler Durden, we're not 100% sure Tyler Durden is Tyler Durden and the narrator doesn't have a name. So feasibly, he could be Hobbes, you know, so that would make perfect sense. There's no like, I mean, there's no like solid evidence. To, there's no solid argument against that because we don't know his name. So it's not like, oh, well, his name is blank or whatever. And even if that was the case, we could go against that anyway. We could say, oh, well, he's lying. But the similarities uh, are too sort of uncanny, if that makes sense. There was an exclusive club in Calvin and Hobbes called Gross, which would be basically like Fight Club. They argue that the film explores themes of alienation and personal transformation, uh, much like the philosophical and psychological undertones of Calvin and Hobbes by they argue, I mean, the people who have posed this theory, um, which would make a lot of sense because, uh, I mean, I've never read Calvin and Hobbes, but it looks quite existential in, and sort of, I, I don't know how to describe it quite, um, I don't know, somber would be a word that would come to mind. Uh, so. It, yeah, I don't see why I, uh, this couldn't be true. I think it's a great little theory as well for people who love Calvin and Hobbes. And I mean, you can't go wrong with theories like this, you know, taking a, a, a sort of whimsical thing for kids and transforming it uh, and or displaying it in something else and finding those 
connections in something deeper and darker. We love it here. We cover those theories a lot, you know. Ned Ryerson is the devil. So in Groundhog Day, basically there's this one guy called Ned Ryerson, and he is this guy who's a cocky, sort of mocking little prick, basically, who essentially, he's always sort of commenting on the main character, who is played by Bill Murray, his situation. For example, um, when he is first introduced, or like when he's first induced into the time loop, Groundhog day itself. Ned insults Phil before just, or the main person I got most of this theory from is superconductive rabbi on Reddit. And he gives some very, very good pieces of evidence to suggest that he is this, this sort of benevolent demonic presence. And is he's so sort of uh, twisted and he seems to have these supernatural abilities that would suggest he knows more. For example, before Phil enters the loop, like, I think just before, might be wrong, he says to him, Ned says to Phil, who's Bill Murray, Bill Murray plays, watch out for the first step, it's a doozy. Now, why would he say this? It literally makes no sense that he would address this step that he's taking as his first, because there's not going to be like another puddle right in front of him. There wasn't another puddle right in front of him. And it's not like he sort of stumbled and then fell. He just put his, do you know what I mean? Like the, the specifics of that and mentioning specifically this, the first step, uh, it just doesn't make any sense why someone would say that, uh, or it would make sense why someone would say it, but to say it like that doesn't make much sense, especially given he's not stepping, he's not like drunk, you know what I mean? Like he's not stepping into like 20 puddles, he steps into one. And the sort of eerie nature of it, actually being his first step into the loop as well obviously would suggest how could he know that he's stepping that's his first step in the loop like there's no other way a character would be able to know unless he was a benevolent omnipotent being that you know either had control of what's going on or knew acknowledge what's going on and given the fact that he's such a prick it's easy to think he's he's a, a devil-like entity or actually just the devil, right? So it's very obvious that he, he wants to basically revel in other people's pain. And funnily enough, the act that actually breaks him free is when Phil buys insurance from Ned, literally from him, the guy that, you know, somehow knows all of this shit about him, you know, the first step, is always mocking him, always like being a, just a dickhead, essentially, and is always, always feels like he has to like, uh, basically take a jab at our main character, right, at Phil. And it just doesn't seem normal, like, especially given that he's maniacally laughing, uh, at something so like remedial and, and just, of no consequence really it just all of these things um would definitely suggest that there's some at least something going on more here that would suggest uh, some sort of demonic devil-like presence or at least something that is of a design that is controlling or aware of a uh, fill situation um there are also many symbolic aspects of the film that could hint to him being the devil too, which you can find in the OP's posters. There are loads. It's a great, great place to read about that theory. Yeah, it's just very, it's very interesting. And also I wouldn't, it, it would fit into the film, I feel like. I feel like it has that fantastical pre uh, element to it. That's not, that wouldn't be beyond using the devil in a film like that. And I feel like in that landscape of cinema, in that time frame of cinema, using de uh, devil-like entities was quite common, or at least I feel it was in films like of this nature, you know, they weren't afraid of doing that. So I can, I'm completely behind this one. Um, and again, it's one of those that really makes you rethink. And that's really the purpose of all these theories and this, these videos is to make you rethink a lot of the characters and the plot points of films that you may once have believed uh, was quite cut and dry, you know. Mary Poppins is on drugs. So this is a good one. I mean, this is just a right fucking meme. As you can hear, I'm British. So Mary Poppins, she's one of our like peeps. She's one of our homies. So, I mean, this is doing us a bit dirty, I won't lie. It's doing us a bit 
it's it's fucking with our image and i just don't appreciate it now just okay i don't care so basically because of the very bright colorful landscape fantastical things that happen and also mary poppins's demeanor uh, within itself people think she's on drugs uh it's basically that simple and there's not much more to it quite frankly um she can fly and shit she can basically do anything beyond the physical realm right and we obviously know especially in this time frame of disney films there's there's like def there's definitely stuff going on that relates to a deeper meaning within those films for example peter pan has undertones of like you know mortality it has undertones of like you could even put it into the realm of like plastic surgery there's loads of things you could do with those titles and they're so open uh, is it is the is the thing about them and eerily open like it just feels like they're so unsubtle that it's creepy does that make sense and it's they're so obvious that it's creepy i don't i really don't know how to explain it there's probably a, a word for it definitely very li liminal space ish backrooms ish uh alice in wonderland is mental i mean it is just mental i love it to death don't get me wrong it's one of my favorite it's pro it's definitely my favorite disney thing uh and no i'm not counting like you know star wars and you know well doctor who isn't owned by disney but now luckily they're just distributing it uh, I'm not talking about that. Well, I, I would even involve Di like Disney Star Wars because they fucked up Star Wars. But it's just, I absolutely love that. And obviously, uh, Alice in Wonderland. It's just it's mental. I mean, there's just so much going on in there that you know definitely point towards something more adult, more adult themes, as well as you know Winnie the Pooh. And there's also a, which would be uh, a deep dive into mental health and each each of the characters representing different mental disorders um and also there's this there, Pin pinocchio there's a scene that is terrifying where they're talking about collecting and uh, whew, i don't know how to say this without getting like getting wrecked by youtube collecting men but not like but before they're men there you go or i think bad and then men before they're men and rounding them up and taking them to pleasure island i mean come on like that's that is f weird for i don't care about like what i don't care what you say oh, oh let's just try to it's trying to scare kids so they don't do this or that but it's like the the ties to epstein there the ties to human trafficking terrifying you know really f just gr just just if you watch the scene you can go and watch the scene it's really oh yeah uh and yeah we know they're pieces of garbage over at disney so you know with the animal abuse as i've talked about i think as well uh air buds look into that that's horrific and you know the kid who all he wanted you know i think two years old he was he was and died and they wouldn't even let him have fucking spider-man on his grave what the fuck man they're they're monsters over there so i wouldn't put it past them basically Star Wars is a story told from R2-D2's perspective. This is another one like the Jurassic Park one in this here, where it's, it's again, it's not really a, th I don't know, I wouldn't know how to, to describe this one. I wouldn't even put it, if it was me, I wouldn't, I'm not slagging off whoever made this iceberg, because it's a really good iceberg, but it's sort of not a theory as much of a, a sort of analysis of the film. Do you get what I mean? Um, I suppose it's a bit different for the Jurassic Park one because that's less about plot and, and uh, sort of characters. It's more about the minutia of it. So that makes more, that would make more sense. But this one is like entirely based around editing the actual plot itself and how it ties into the characters, the writing, how, how the characters are written and just, just the overall, I suppose, feel of the film. Uh, is, is how this is approached and I wouldn't yeah again I wouldn't put it I wouldn't say it's a theory it's more like an analysis and it actually has a lot of grounds in reality if you watch The Hidden Fortress by Akira Kurosawa really good film which George Lucas has said was a big influence on Star Wars you can see I mean like literally the two characters that R2 and C3P are based on 
are the two characters of that film and it's a very it's very very similar it's very very similar how they're depicted uh and, and the editing and the writing around them is very uh very similar and it would make sense because i mean r2 could potentially you could even make the point that he's the protagonist of the film he's the one carrying the main plot device of the entire film he's the one guarding it carrying it so it, it, yeah it would make a lot of sense and Chuck Noland is unknowingly stuck in a reality show. So basically, the main character of Castaway, which, don't shoot me, I haven't seen, I want to see it, okay? But the main character, the theory is that the main character is in a sort of Truman Show uh, scenario where, uh, you know, obviously he's being broadcasted for people's amusement, uh, amusement and basically it's all one big setup simulation uh, set. The sort of examples or pieces of evidence that people have is the fact that he's basically able to, able to survive certain circumstances, which suggests that it's a reality show and that, you know, none of this is real. Perhaps when he's sleeping, they give him certain nutrients things like that and the fact that you know he's basically able to endure all this shit out the circumstances and i think he's a postman if i if i'm right uh, like he's not a survivalist so i mean again i haven't seen it i think this would make sense in terms of cinematic influence because i think castaway was made a bit before Ca uh a bit before castaway castaway was made a bit before castaway before the truman show which i think the truman yeah the truman show is definitely 1999 so it was around the same time so in terms of cinematic influence as to why the director or writers would want to do that it would make a lot of sense the Breakfast Club are in purgatory. The title says it all, but mostly the evidence is what's, I suppose, the most interesting in this, or the the claims. Uh, so I was doing a lot of sort of, I suppose you could say, research and thinking on this this particular theory because I love The Breakfast Club and this gives it a whole new life for me because I sort of fell out of love with it for a bit uh, over the last. Uh, year year and a half two years maybe so this sort of breathes a lot breathes a lot of fresh air into it so firstly why is the school open and fully lit on a saturday why is every like every single hallway is lit every part of the school basically that we see is lit even the vents are lit up right when bender's going through the the ventilation system secondly there's a point in the film that i noticed on research looking for clips at the beginning uh of the film where uh, i think it's vernon the the teacher that's watching them says don't mess with the bull and bulls in christianity basically represent the want for a more spiritual uh life beyond like animalistic instincts and they basically the represent the desire for peace as well which would be a direct symbol within the film of a sort of the the characters wanting to leave purgatory you know uh repent for their sins discuss their sins at least and be able to be free and like you know pass on to heaven or whatever belief right this isn't just a belief for christianity by the way or uh catholic catholicism sorry this could be implemented into any religion because i think most religions have a purgatory uh or something similar and could even you know and spiritually you know it's just interesting purgatory for me sort of other ethereal realms like that are very interesting and intrigue me a lot so that would make a lot of sense they want to they want to have solace and peace and through that the ability to move on to be free their souls you know be free from sin whatever you you think uh this could represent or also you know your religion that's a good thing about this one is that it's it's quite an open one to where you know it could be any religion really uh, i mean i don't again i don't know if lots of religions have a purgatory but i'm sure they do another thing 
that's within the theory is that Bender is actually an angel and he's testing everyone. That's why he sort of goes back and forth in terms of like his allegiance, you know. At, at the very beginning of the film, you just think, oh, this guy's a cunt, this guy's a dickhead. And then as the film goes on, he sort of becomes a good, more sacrificial person. So what if the first part was a veneer and the second part, the latter part of his character was the, the, the reality? Obviously, it could be the other way around. It could be that he's a demon, right? Or perhaps he's a demon that's transforming into an angel. We're watching his transformation. There's another theory as well that my mum told me. So shout out to my mum that it's the entire film is in uh, the the one that the outsider her perspective of a dream because she becomes pretty she gets the guy she gets everything she wants she gets you know she gets all she gets to do all this stuff without like real consequence um and she also doesn't look like you know she doesn't nothing f is fearful to her and there's a dreamlike essence to the breakfast club that would also support that and support this theory for the most part for example like the outside of the school from what i remember and i, I don't think i was able to find many clips of that or any it's a quite a a, a bright exterior uh it, it's almost angelic it's almost you know represents some sort of ethereal plane and just the the strange architecture of the school as well would represent that uh also don't you forget about me that's not talking about their you know them meeting and then going off and uh, hanging out with who they usually would you know doing the usual things that they would within their lives i mean that wouldn't make any sense anyway because they're all they're all changed after this we know that that's the whole point of the film they're, they're they've all become better people and they've changed and they've they've opened themselves up right this it actually means don't you you know don't you forget about me because they're dead right because they've passed on that's why they should, no one should, people shouldn't forget about them. So that's a really good one. I love that that part. There's also another thing about the the angelic nature or that Bender's working uh, for some sort of other being, uh, godly being, is the end when he is walking across the uh, I think football field or American football field, baseball field. I'm not sure. When he's walking through, firstly, he's walking away, like he's not with anyone else, which wouldn't make any sense. Why aren't they all like hanging out together after this? Or at least why isn't he hanging out with Claire? She wouldn't care about what her parents thought. She's gone through a transformation, right? Why Why does she care? That's because she's. he's walking onto another, that's because he's walking onto another uh, mission, I suppose you call it, uh, to save other people's souls, right? And send them off to heaven right and free their souls and he also he punches up to the air and looks up to the air and he's got sunglasses on as well which would represent or not represent but which would you know mean well why has he got it's not like it's literally the um it's what it's sort of the time that it is now it's becoming sunset right the sun's going down why does he need sunglasses on um so this is like he, he maybe he's looking up to god looking up to heaven looking up to a godly being that's so bright that he can't you know he has to put sunglasses on uh, and obviously he's looking up and he's happy that he succeeded in his mission right of helping these people the architecture of it doesn't make a lot of sense and there are prison sort of prison gar bars uh that would symbolize you know purgatory you can't just leave purgatory right it's like a prison but that could represent a mental prison and the amount of stuff they're like able to get away with and like part of me uh just sneak past vernon uh, like while running is mental right but yeah this is one of my favorites of all time lots of theories have purgatory lots of film theories use purgatory but i think this actually has real grounds to suggest that you know it's amazing i love this theory james bond is a time lord so this theory really patches up a lot of the age problems with james bond now i'm not sure if every film addresses him as james bond uh I, i'm really not sure about that but the age the the problem with the age of him you know he's like all at one second he's 50 then he's like 40 or like 30 or whatever it doesn't make a lot of like it doesn't make any sense actually sorry um and it would be patched up a lot with you know him being a time lord 
uh, which I've loved Doctor Who, I've loved Doctor Who ever since I was like three, you know, well, probably early, earlier than that. Um, and it's just very close to me. And lots of things could be patched up with those characters being Time Lords. I'm not saying, you know, throw it about, but some things when you, you know, really analyze it could, right? And this is definitely one of them. Look at, you know, Peter to Jody, right? Look at even Tom to Peter Davison. Look at um, John Pertwee to Tom, right? That all of these uh, big changes, eat, well, one of the big ones would be Matt Smith to Peter Capaldi, right? Lots of big age changes there. We all know uh, Time Lords can age physically different throughout each incarnation, right? So that's not a stretch at all. And by, you know, as far as I know, they could, I think, transform into other species. Um, I'm not sure about that, that part though, because I don't think we've ever seen that. Uh, no, I don't think we have. But yeah, um, this one patches up a lot of problems and molds to really uh, good, but I'm more close to Doctor Who, so I'm gonna say Doctor Who's better, obviously. Uh, and I just think it is, it's, I think it's the best TV show ever made. I really do. Um, but yeah, James Bond, you know, all the James Bond fans uh, can be happy as well with like, you know, the continuity possibly being fixed with that. Uh, and yeah, I love, again, I've said before, I love Skyfall. Uh, and there's some James Bond films that are just incredible, but it's not like, it's not something I'd go and watch all of them with, right? personally um but some of them are really really good like like i said skyfall but um yeah this one's a really ah it's a really nice one it's like a really uh yeah it's a good one and it's interesting when you when you start to think about the mechanics of it you know yeah, that is the end of Tier 4. Thank you guys so much for the support. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy you guys are enjoying this. I'm absolutely just having a great time uh, with this series. And uh, yeah, I've started a blog, by the way, for film, film uh, analysis articles and stuff like that. Uh, so if you want to check that out, absolutely uh, go for it. I'd really appreciate it. Love to see you guys there. And if you want to check out the Kofi link, it will be below. It's not mandatory though at all. Uh, but I would I really appreciate it. Um, but I just, yeah, I really appreciate your guys' support. That's what means the most. Tier 5 is going to be an absolute banger. Uh, some re uh, some really, really good stuff. We're starting to get into really, really good theories here. Like this, this is starting to get the most dark and obscure sort of ones uh, or the most interesting ones i suppose if you have any theories as well absolutely leave them below and i'll uh, i'll cover them if i think uh they fit and if i like them they probably will so don't be afraid to to leave them in the comments uh and we'll uh, we'll cover them for the end of this uh series get excited for it peeps get put, put it in your calendar you know what i mean and uh yeah thank you guys so much i will see you out there neon hunting